from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. Welcome to our program, The Origins of the RNA World, a collective oral history. We're glad you're here. We're glad the Metro shut down yesterday, not today. This is a good thing. Um, I'm Dan Torello. I'm on staff of the uh, Kluge Center. And before we, be we begin, I want to remind you of a couple of items. We're recording today's conversation for future placement on the library's YouTube and iTunes channels. Uh, and also, please turn off any cell phones or any other devices that might interfere with the conversation. Uh, this afternoon's conversation is being moderated by Nathaniel Comfort. He is the Bloomberg NASA Library of Congress Chair in Astrobiology. I'm uh, going to introduce him in just a few moments, uh, but first a few words about the Kluge Center and about the Bloomberg program as a whole. The Kluge Center was created 16 years ago, uh, thanks to a generous gift by philanthropist John W. Kluge. Uh, we have two primary roles. The first is to create a scholarly community of approximately 100 scholars every year. Uh, these are senior scholars, postdoctoral fellows, uh, pre-doctoral fellows, all of whom contribute to a uh, vibrant uh, community here on Capitol Hill and in the library. Uh, the second function is to administer the Kluge Prize. Uh, this is awarded by the Librarian of Congress. It's a $1 million award that recognizes lifetime achievement in the study of humanity. Uh, it was last awarded to uh, philosophers Jürgen Habermas and Charles Taylor this past summer. So within the Kluge Center, the Bloomberg Chair in Astrobiology is the result of uh, what has been a unique and rewarding collaboration between NASA and the Library of Congress. Uh, the chair takes its name from Nobel Prize winner Barry Bloomberg. He was the founder of the NASA Astrobiology Institute and also a founding member of the Library of Congress Scholars Council. Uh, Bloomberg envisioned the creation of a chair in the Kluge Center that would focus on the humanistic and societal impacts of astrobiology. Uh, the idea was to connect scientific discoveries in the field of astrobiology with the best thinking in the humanities and social sciences. And astrobiology as a field of inquiry in particular is, is uh, one that allows for the, the big questions, things like uh, investigations on the origins of life about which we are going to hear more about this afternoon. So placing scientific knowledge within the context of historical and philosophical thinking gives us the chance to consider questions of meaning and of value uh, that are important to us as human beings. Nathaniel is the third chair to be in residence. Uh, our first chair was uh, David Grinspoon, who I see uh, sitting here in the back. Uh, he researched a book on the Anthropocene. Uh, we then had historian of science Stephen Dick uh, who wrote about the potential societal impact of the discovery of microbial or complex life beyond Earth. Uh, and this year we've been thrilled to have Nathaniel with us uh, since October, and he is looking at the history of the genomic revolution and origin of life research. Uh, in addition to holding the, uh, the Bloomberg chair here at the Kluge Center, Nathaniel is professor in the Department of the History of Medicine at the Johns Hopkins University. Uh, he has published uh, scores of articles and several books. I mentioned just a few of the more salient ones. The Science of Human Perfection, How Genes Became the Heart of American Medicine, published by Yale in 2012. The Tangled Field, Barbara McClintock's Search for the Patterns of Genetic Control, published by Harvard in 2001. He's also the editor of the uh, volume, The Panda's Black Box, opening up the intelligent design debate published by Hopkins in 2007. Uh, he writes extensively for The Atlantic, The Nation, The New York Times, Book Review, and other outlets. He also blogs, so you can look, uh, look this up. Uh, his blog is genotopia.scienceblog.com. So we've been thrilled to have him with us this year, uh, and we're grateful to him for bringing such a distinguished group of uh, panelists to the library today, and we look forward to a uh, fascinating program. Well, thank you, Dan. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here, and I would just like to begin by 
uh, uh, with a word of thanks to the Kluge Center. This is an absolutely marvelous and a unique place to be. I'll just tell you how, how great it is. When I got my acceptance letter, it had a line in it saying that we expect you to protect your time for research and scholarship and reflection. Now, how rare is that, I mean, in these days? So this is a wonderful place, and I'm, I'm delighted to be here. And I'm particularly thrilled to have this distinguished panel of uh, guests with me today to talk about the RNA world, which is an important aspect of research on the origin of life. And I'm just going to introduce them briefly in alphabetical order. Uh, first, uh, W. Ford Doolittle who's from uh, Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. He got a PhD in his PhD in uh, biological sciences from Stanford. He then did postdoctoral work with uh, the distinguished scientists Saul Spiegelman and Norm Pace. He then joined the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at Dalhousie in 1971, and he's been there ever since. He's won a Guggenheim Fellowship. He's a, mem a member of the fellow, a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, a member of the National Academy of Sciences, and on and on, many distinguished honors. And his research is on, has been on the molecular genetics of microbes uh, and things like lateral gene transfer, instead of hereditary transfer, uh, transfer of genetic material across species, selfish DNA, gene structure, uh, particularly introns, about which I'm going to say uh, a little bit in a moment, and the tree of life. And one thing that's really uh, quite distinctive about this, this scientist is that he right now has two postdoctoral fellows who are philosophers of science. So he really bridges uh, the sciences and humanities, which is something that I, I find really appealing. George Fox is the Moores Professor of Biochemistry and Biology at the University of Houston. Uh, he got his PhD in Chemical Engineering from Syracuse. He's the co-discoverer with Carl Woese of the archaea, one of the three fundamental uh, domains of life, which really uh, overturned the way people thought life evolved. He um, is a uh, fellow of the International Astrobiological Society, member of the American Academy of Microbiology, a fellow of the American Academy of the Asso Association of Science. Uh, and his research has been on the evolution of the machinery of genetic translation, how information moves from, uh, from nucleic acids into amino acids and forming proteins that form the enzymes and uh, interesting structures in the body. Ray Jesland is the Emeritus Professor of Biology and the former Vice President of Research at the University of Utah. He's a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator. His PhD was from Harvard, uh, where he studied with James Watson. Uh, he did postdoctoral work in Geneva, Switzerland, and joined Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory in 1967, uh, being, staying there until 1978 when he joined the University of Utah. Uh, with Ray White, he began a new and very, now very distinguished Institute for Human Genetics. Uh, and since 1972, he has collaborated with John Atkins on the uh, phenomenon of genetic recoding. He is the editor of the volume RNA World, so he wrote the book. Uh, or at least edited it, and uh, which is now in its fourth edition. So it's really the sort of Bible of, the, of this field. So it's really a delight to have him. And Walter Gilbert is the Carl Loeb Emeritus Professor uh, at Harvard. He's, uh, he has a doctorate in physics from the University of Cambridge and was appointed to the Harvard Physics Department in 1959. He then switched from physics to biology, and he ran uh, a, a lab jointly with uh, James D. Watson of the double helix fame. He won a Nobel Prize in chemistry in 1980 for the, uh, the invention um, of uh, a method of DNA sequencing. 
And he's a pioneer in biotechnology. He founded Biogen, one of the first biotech companies, if not the first. Uh, he oversaw the development of a number of groundbreaking products, including alpha interferon and the hepatitis B vaccine. And he also co-founded the uh, large biotechnology company Myriad Genetics. Other honors uh, besides the Nobel Prize include Louis Louisa Gross Horwitz Prize, the Gairdner Award from Canada, the Lasker Award, National Academy of Sciences. He's a, a foreign member of the Royal Society, British Royal Society, and on and on. His research uh, has included the identification of messenger RNA, uh, the uh, LAC repressor, uh, fundamental component of the, uh, the lactose gene in bacteria, model system. Uh, pioneering work in recombinant DNA, the first genetic engineering, uh, including the expression of insulin in bacteria. He was a founding uh, a pioneer member of the Human Genome Project, and he coined the term RNA world. So. It is an absolute thrill to have these gentlemen here with me today and to get into a conversation with them. And before we start that, I just want to give a few remarks uh, just to make sure we're all on the same page, just introduce you to the idea of the RNA world. Okay? So, I can't see, oh, here we are. So, what is the RNA world? Well. Beginning 1953, uh, James Watson, Francis Crick, uh, aided by Morris Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin, of course, solved the double helical structure of DNA. Now, the double helix, the shape of the molecule usually gets all the, the credit, but the, the really interesting thing about it is those bars on the, on the ladder uh, crossing the spiral staircase, because those, are, those symbolize the nucleotide bases that pair up. So it's really two half spiral staircases, right? Uh, each specifying uh, another nucleic acid. And, it was, and they realized that in the sequence of those bases was genetic information. Okay? So it was in the DNA that the, uh, the, the information was held for making proteins. DNA information goes to protein. The, the A's, C's, G's, and T's of DNA turns into the amino acids that are strung together to form proteins. Proteins are crucial um, uh, uh, molecules in, in the cell. They do all, all sorts of work. Um, they are enzymes, most importantly, uh, but they're also structural and uh, the basis of you know, uh, 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 neuronal transmission and uh, structure el structural elements in the cell and so forth. Crucial, crucial uh, components of the cell. And in 1956, three years after the double helix, uh, Francis Crick coined what he whimsically called the central dogma of molecular biology, and uh, Watson drew it out in this cartoon, which uh, says a number of things about the flow of genetic information. This was really the first time people began to think about genetic information. And the important thing that most people remember of the central dogma is this simple uh, phrase, DNA makes RNA makes protein, okay? So what's DNA versus RNA? They're very similar molecules. There are really only two differences between them. Uh, uh, one of the four bases is different. Uh, they use, RNA uses uracil instead of thymine. And you'll see uh, there that there's uh, on the on the ring there's one difference an OH instead of an H those are the only differences between the two molecules but those two slight differences make huge differences in the chemistry and DNA of course forms a double stranded molecule RNA is usually single stranded and that means it can bend around and do form into all kinds of different shapes Right? Uh, it's also much more reactive than DNA. And those two facts become important in the RNA world. Okay, so 
The, the DNA makes, RNA makes protein through two processes, one called transcription, where an RNA mo molecule, messenger RNA, which uh, Dr. Gilbert uh, was uh, a, a key figure in, in identifying. And then that messenger RNA is translated into a sequence of amino acids that makes a protein. Okay? And as I said, proteins are, are ubiquitous in the cell. They form hair, nails, muscles, nerve cells, and most importantly, enzymes. Uh, there are a couple of, and that translation process is really uh, sort of the heart of what we're going to be talking about today. Translation occurs in structures called ribosomes. So the messenger RNA is read off the DNA, and then the, it moves outside the cell nucleus to the out, outer part of the cell. And in the ribosome, it is pulled through like a, uh, like, like a tape through a tape recorder, and it is read off, and uh, the sequence of those nucleotides specifies the sequence of amino acids. So this building chain of, uh, of amino acids then forms the protein. Now you'll notice a couple of things here. Uh, one is that there is an awful lot of RNA here. You have the messenger RNA, ribosomal RNA. The ribosome itself is made of RNA, mostly. And then, uh, if I can get one more, and then transfer RNA is the molecule that actually attaches to the amino acid and brings it to the building chain. So there's a lot of RNA in this, in this part of the cell. Okay? People very quickly began to notice uh, this fact, and uh, in 1962, one of the uh, pioneers of molecular biology, Alex Rich, uh, gave a paper on the origin of life. So this is just nine years after the double helix, and in fact was the year that Watson, Crick, and Wilkins won the Nobel Prize. And he said the hypothetical stem or parent nucleotide molecule was initially an RNA-like polymer, which was able to convey genetic information as well as organize the amino acids into a specific sequence to make proteins. Okay? So, there's a, so RNA does most of the work of that process. Right? And in 1965, just three years later, two other scientists made similar realizations. Uh, J.B.S. Haldane said that life uh, by, by which he meant indefinite replication of patterns of large molecules, can be based on RNA without DNA. And Fritz Littmann this, at the same conference said that uh, it, the DNA probably evolved later than RNA. So there was a time in which you had RNA and proteins and not yet DNA. Okay? So back to this uh, diagram here, another thing that we can notice about this is that there are enzymes or proteins involved in each of these processes. So none of this, although there are RNA molecules involved, none of this can happen without enzymes, without proteins. All right, so these things are specifying proteins and you need proteins to do it. So that leads to a kind of chicken and egg problem Right? where you have genes that store information that encode proteins that make enzymes, and you need those, those enzymes to catalyze the reactions to copy the genes. So how do you get out of that problem? The RNA world is the way you get out of that problem. Okay? Uh, in, and several people noticed this in a speculative way in the late 1960s. Carl Woese said that proto-RNA could have been, the uh, proto-ribosomal RNA could have been the original genome. And Francis Crick the next year said that possibly the first enzyme was an RNA molecule with replicase properties, the, the ability to copy other RNAs. Thus, a system based mainly on RNA is not impossible. And the same year, his colleague, Leslie Orgel, said, uh, asked, could polynucleotides of RNA with well-defined secondary structures folding act as primitive enzymes? Could they be more than just information storage molecules? Could they actually catalyze reactions too? That would be a way out of the chicken and egg problem. 
So the answer is yes. But hang on one sec. Uh, first, I want to tell you about a couple of things that are going to come up in the conversation. One is the, uh, the uh, what, as I mentioned earlier, the discovery of the archaea, this brand new group of, of uh, single-celled organisms that, um, that George and Carl Woese recognized through sequencing RNA, ribosomal RNA, were different from the bacteria. And so uh, the, this created a lot of discussion about how, uh, how what, were the, what was the original branching structure in the tree of life. Okay? And the same year, 1977 was a big year for origin of life research, uh, was, uh, Phil Sharp and his colleagues at Yale and Rich Roberts at Cold Spring Harbor and uh, his colleagues independently discovered that genes come in pieces. In higher organisms, eukaryotes, uh, organisms with, a, with a, a, a membrane bound nucleus that contains the chromosomes, have genes that can be segmented Okay. They can, and when you go through the transcription and translation process, those middle bits between the segments get spliced out and the segments join together to form the final RNA that gets read into the protein. So that's really odd. Genes come in these pieces. Walter Gilbert wrote an article the next year called Genes in Pieces. And in that paper, he named those segments exons for the segments that are part of the genes and introns as the segments between the exons. So they're inter, in, the, uh, in between the exons. Okay? Uh, and he and Ford Doolittle, uh, over the next few years, got in a, uh, a lively discussion about, uh, about which came first, when introns were invented evolutionarily? Were they part of the very first organisms or did they get invented later as the eukaryotes uh, evolved? So this is a, was a very important discussion uh, in origin of life research that I want to talk about more later. And then finally, the discovery of RNA enzymes. Crick and Orga were right. RNA can act as an enzyme, and that was found first by, uh, by Tom Cech uh, um, in 1982, and then uh, Sidney Altman at Yale found that an, an, a molecule that called RNase P that he'd been working on for years also had, uh, the RNA also had catalytic properties. So RNA can act as both a catalyst and an information molecule. So that breaks the chicken and egg problem, right? So this is kind of like the old Saturday Night Live sketch where you have the um, you know, shimmer, which, which is a floor wax and a dessert topping all in one, right? The next, uh, just a couple of years later, uh, Walter Gilbert wrote an article called The RNA World. And this was the coining of the term, okay? And we're gonna talk more about that. I just wanna put that up there so, that, so you have a sense of the dates, okay? Uh, in 19... 87, Cold Spring Harbor held a meeting uh, on RNA catalysis that involved a lot of discussion about the RNA world. And in 1993, Ray Jestland and John Atkins edited a, uh, a volume of uh, a collection of papers called The RNA World. And as I said, uh, it went through multiple editions. Uh, I, I forgot to put up the fourth. What, what year did the fourth edition come out? 2011, okay? So this is a, still a very vital and, and ongoing project, all right? So that is a quick introduction to the RNA world. Uh, now I am going to sit down. I'm going to mostly turn it over to them. Thank you. Okay, just wave your hands or something if you can't hear or can't see. I'm trying to get out of the way, but I also want to make sure that I'm in conversation with, with my guests here. So... With that, uh, let's begin with evolution. Theodosius Dobzhansky famously said that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. But the early generation of molecular biologists were often criticized for not taking evolution 
sufficiently seriously. Uh, one of those critics, at least in my reading, was Carl Woese. What do you think? Is that criticism fair? To what extent did the RNA world emerge from evolutionary thinking? I mean, from thought based on serious reading of evolutionary literature. That's, a, that's <laughs> I think that's an unfortunate question. I do agree. The early <laughs> generation of molecular biologists did not, uh, the most part, didn't think of evolution. The discovery of the DNA sequencing in 76, discovery of DNA sequencing in 76, suddenly made it possible to look at the genes of many organisms. And one of the first things that happened as molecular biologists did this was they discovered that the genes in Drosophila were like the genes in plants and things like that. And suddenly, evolution swept the field. I remember a Gordon conference in which, in fact, this sort of suddenly became a fantastic element in people's thinking. Those of us who had a slightly more genetic background were more conscious of evolution, but the general field of molecular biology was not. Um, I think the RNA world image is deeply based in a notion of evolution. Um, the point of the paper that I wrote in 1986 was twofold. It one, it picked up from arguments uh, that had been made, uh, the fact, uh, I would say, it picked up from the discovery of the RNA enzymes that had been made and reiterated just before that. And it picked up from an older notion from the biochemists that RNA was more primary than DNA. And the biochemistry of that is that all of the DNA structures, the DNA sugars and the DNA of the DNA bases and nucleotides are made from RNA precursors. So if you look at the biochemistry, you would not say DNA is separate in any way or primary in any way. You'd say, oh, the chemistry suggests that RNA is the thing that you made biochemically, and from that you would later make DNA. People knowing that thought of a RNA protein world. RNA is a genetic material, machines in the organism, and that genetic material can be used to dictate the sequence of amino acids. And amino acids were thought of as, oh, the interesting things in the world, the enzymes. And the protein chemists ignored the nucleic acids intensely. They thought everything interesting in the world was in the proteins. It makes very interesting meetings in which the protein chemists meet separately and the nucleic acid chemists <laughs> meet separately, and they never like to talk to each other, and the protein chemists totally ignored nucleic acids. Nobody could translate between the two languages. But the, um, but, um, the discovery of the enzymatic activity of RNA made me think that maybe RNA could be entirely played the role of all of the enzymes. And so the paper I wrote in 86 makes actually two statements. One, it suggests maybe RNA enzymes could in fact do all of the necessary activities for a cell to exist, including the copying of RNA itself. And therefore you could imagine evolution is beginning with a small RNA molecule that develops by random structures, random association of bases, the ability to copy itself. And once it can copy itself, it can make more, it makes more copies. But in fact, since it's a biological process, it makes copies which would also have errors, and so it can evolve. It can make random changes, and those random changes can be acted upon by natural selection to eventually produce better molecules. Second part of that essay, however, points out that because one of the RNA enzymes that was then known at that time was an intron, the region inside an RNA molecule, it could splice itself out. I could make the argument that that activity clearly could be used not only to splice introns out of the RNA, but by combining two of those structures, develop a structure that could move an RNA piece around from one molecule to the other inserting it like a transposon, splicing out the, the rest and creating a novel RNA combination. And that's a very powerful evolutionary tool. We call it recombination when it occurs at the DNA level, 
but in fact here was a model that clearly could happen at the RNA level. And so I could immediately in that paper suggest two things. Maybe there could be an RNA-based organism completely using RNA as enzymes, and the evolutionary processes would be able to shuffle the pieces of RNA around to make novel pieces again. Uh, the original intron exon idea you alluded to, yes. the critical element of that idea was an evolutionary argument. It was not just the biochemical argument that you had on the DNA long regions that we call introns that are spliced out of the RNA molecule to produce small pieces. Together they code for pieces of the protein. But the evolutionary argument is that by spreading those regions apart in the DNA, you would increase the recombination rates between those regions. And hence you could more rapidly mm -hmm. create protein structures and evolve them to better function by recombination and by shuffling the pieces of the protein. So in fact, both the intron exon idea is conditioned by a vision of evolution, and the RNA world idea is also conditioned by that vision of evolution. That paper, in fact, finally includes that sort of de a hidden definition of life as that thing which can, by replication, mutation, and recombination, as by changing, random changes, can evolve and thus can be operated upon by natural selection to produce ever better functioning. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I think that was a very fortunate question in that case. <laughs> uh, I can now throw away half my questions, but we're... Uh, <laughs> Ford, I think you might have something to say on this. Yeah, well, I, uh, um, I think your initial question involved the phrase serious reading of the evolutionary literature or something like that, and mm. I think most molecular biologists did not seriously read the evolutionary literature probably still don't. Um, mostly evolution is something you talk about in the last paragraph of the paper, I think, <laughs> and over a few beers kind of thing. Uh, right. Because I think there was a general feeling in, amongst the molecular biological community that evolution obviously was important, but also there was nothing you could really say about it, so you could just say whatever you wanted and everybody would accept <laughs> it politely. And I, I think the... Uh, I think that's right. I think you were right that 1977 was a very important year for some of us, and, and I, I, I want to go back a little bit about the intron relationship mm -hmm. to, to yeah. the RNA world, because um, I was in Wally's lab on sabbatical at that time, and um, Wally came back from Switzerland, um, I think having heard for the first time about the introns and the immunoglobulin genes, I believe, and gave, uh, there were lab meetings once a week in Wally's lab with very strong tea, as I recall, and uh, he presented it the was tea and not something stronger. It was, <laughs> and Wally presented the exon shuffling idea, which I thought was a brilliant way for things to evolve more rapidly and in the way that he just described. But I had one concern about that, which was, uh, I believe, thinking the way that most of people, for most people, thought in those days, we imagined that higher cells, eukaryotes, animals and plants, evolved from bacteria, and bacteria don't have introns, and eukaryotes, higher cells, do have introns. And so that sort of implied that these relatively advanced cells would suddenly take on these interruptions in all their genes just so that they could in the future do a better job of evolving, which seemed not something who anybody who had done any serious reading the evolutionary literature would be willing to accept yeah. was possible. You're, you're, not, you're not quite fair. I, I'm not blaming you for that. No, 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 no. I, was, I, was, I, was going to, I was going to enlarge. At that moment, we knew of the introns only in more complicated genes. And so That's the true. first suggestion, I, um, I learned about the introns and exons from the people who discovered the splicing in the, in the Cold Spring Harbor meeting in probably May or June okay. that year. And in my laboratory, we had a sequence of a immunoglobulin gene, which actually had an intron. Mm -hmm. We had just sequenced it. We didn't actually know what that was, but it was an intron. So I, when I came back from Switzerland, having thought about these ideas, I suggested that eukaryotes uniquely use right. the greater evolutionary speed of recombination within introns to produce the great right. explosion Precambrian explosion of the eukaryotic genes. And that's the background. And, and, and that's what I objected to. Right. Because, um, because of, if we believed, which I think 99% of the people believed at that time, that eukaryotes came from prokaryotes, then they would have had to have taken on the burden of introns and 10 introns on average in every gene 
in order that uh, several million years down the road, they'd be able to do these wonderful evolutionary things, which seemed kind of uh, anticipatory and, and not the kind of thing evolution really can't look ahead. So that was my, my reaction to what you, you presented. I don't think you actually implied that, but it was my reaction. And I also happened to be privileged because I had worked in Urbana and I knew Carl Woes and I knew George and I knew about this almost simultaneous publication of the, of the three domain view of life that George and, and Carl Woes had been working on that in their view, eukaryotes and prokaryotes were not evolved. I mean, it wasn't that eukaryotes evolved from within the prokaryotes, they evolved separately from some more primitive ancestral form. So then I thought, well, actually went home and had a bottle of scotch and wrote overnight that piece. <laughs> and, and I thought that, um, you know, it make more sense if introns were actually present in the very beginning. And then um, as evolution proceeded, um, prokaryotes lost all the introns, but eukaryotes retained them. And this gave them the evolutionary ability to become complex organisms like ourselves. And prokaryotes haven't done that, although they've done a lot of other wonderful things. And they've gotten much more streamlined. We use the word streamlining. Streamlining, yes. And um, so I showed that to Wally. And I think he thought, oh, that was interesting. I thought it was a very good idea. Yeah, thank you. And. Uh, <laughs> And then I got in the mail a, a, mail a, a paper from Jim Darnell, who had been thinking along those same lines. Was it Yale? Uh, he was, um, was it Rockefeller at that time. Rockefeller, Rock right. Okay. Yes. You're putting everybody at Yale. I'm sorry. Yeah. A lot of people were there. It's well, a lot of people, a lot of people were not. <laughs> so, so this so sharp wasn't. <laughs> so I think there were several things that came together at that time. There was a belief that several of us had, and a guy named Daryl Rainey had been articulating before that, and I think both Jim Darnell and I had this kind of gut feeling, and I got it just from teaching molecular biology. You know, you teach about bacterial cells, and they're all so elegantly designed and quick and easy, and then you look at a prokaryote and say, oh my God, what a mess. You know, how, I mean, a eukaryote, what a mess. How messy is the molecular biology of higher organisms compared to bacteria? So one way to respond to that is to say, well, maybe it's primitive. Maybe they just never got over the beginning. And you know, the beginning was a messy time and, and eukaryotes are still messy. So that was part of that. And, um, but I think when Jim Darnell and I were thinking about exon shuffling, and I think when Wally was thinking about it at that time, we imagined it was a DNA process. I think we imagined that the, that the genomes which were putting together their genes from exons were actually DNA genomes. Mm -hmm. And then, but certainly for the eukaryotes. Yeah, and then, and then when when uh, Tom Check reported the, the splicing of introns, it occurred to several of us simultaneously, and to Daryl Rainey a little bit before me, anyway, that you could just recast that whole theory in terms of the RNA world, which is what your '86 paper did. Mm -hmm. That's my. Mm. Well, you, you know, you you published the introns early argument, and I found it sufficiently attractive. That I adopted it. That you tried to prove it. <laughs> and worked on it extensively. Yeah. I still find it very attractive. Do you believe it? Certainly. Oh, okay. I don't Do believe it. You don't I don't believe it? <laughs> you, you, you recanted, but I. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> George, Ray? George? Well, well, I was reflecting on the comment regarding the role of RNA in, in the earlier times and the importance of RNA. And I remember teaching classes and I would talk, I was teaching on protein synthesis and I would teach the students about ribosomal RNA, which was called R, small R, capital RNA, ribosomal RNA. And there, of course, there's a gene for ribosomal RNA, you know, there's genes. And so there's something called ribosomal DNA, RDNA, which codes for the ribosomal RNAs, okay? And then I come to learn from my students that no, 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 I didn't know what I was talking about. Our DNA means recombinant DNA, <laughs> <laughs> okay? Because these people in the cell biology, et cetera, et cetera, they thought RNA was completely and totally just irrelevant. And, and, and so, I mean, that, and that's the way it was for many, many years until this RNA hypothesis came along. Now, about the RNA hypothesis, there's, uh, there's still a lot of ongoing controversy because there's two aspects to it. Uh, one is, where did the RNA come from? 
So you need to have the RNA come from some kind of prebiotic chemistry, presumably. And, and so it's proven to be rather difficult to define where the RNA comes from. And so one of the alternative theories is that, well, by the way, DNA was not the original genetic material. RNA was the original genetic material, not DNA. So DNA, so DNA replaced RNA as the genetic material. Therefore, maybe some other nucleic acid replaced, was the predecessor of RNA, and that predecessor would therefore be easier to somehow make in a prebiotic world. But in any event, somehow, if you're going to have this RNA world, the RNAs have to come, come there has to be some mechanism for producing the RNAs, and there's not, Though some progress has been made, actually, there's not yet a truly convincing uh, argument of where the RNA came from to create the RNA world. Now, the other problem that maybe is easier to solve is the problem of the replicase. One of the key components of the RNA world, or the full RNA world, is, uh, is the idea that you have a replicase. And so people have sought for many years to find an RNA that could replicate another RNA. And again, some progress has been made, but the systems involved are actually seem quite artificial, and they're relatively complex. So in my case, I've come to propose what I call an abbreviated RNA world. Because the thing which ultimately will terminate the RNA world is the presence of proteins. And uh, Wally actually pointed this out in, in his original article in 1986, but once you have protein synthesis, the RNA world quickly will evolve to become an RNA protein world. And so our feeling is that, in fact, the first thing the RNA world successfully does is create the protein synthesis machinery. And so that, therefore, you never reach the point where you're having RNA enzymes catalyzing uh, various metabolic pathways and, and stuff like that. So the original RNAs uh, end up being involved in creating proteins. And so that's, so, that, so that's sort of where things are right now. There's, there's two mysteries, where the RNA come from and how do we, replicate, how do we find a self-replicating thing. And so people are very worried about both of those things. The peptide synthesis idea, the proto-ribosome idea, gets rid of the second problem, doesn't solve the first. So, hmm. so could you say that one of the functions of RNA early on was, was essentially to make part, itself partly obsolete? Well, not on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> That, that, by the way, that's an evolutionary argument. Yes, that's, an, that's, that, that's something you can't select for. No. See, see, the, problem, the problem with that, the, the advantage of the RNA world model, full model, uh -huh. is that because there is a replication of RNA, replication of the enzymatic structure right. that's making more RNA, you can, the structure can evolve mm -hmm. right. and can be selected right. for and better forms can arise. The problem with the proto-RNA image that you created is there's no replication in it. Right. And therefore, there is no use of the evolutionary forces to make better forms. And so it has to arise by accident in its final form before it can actually even begin to work. Whereas the RNA world model, in the form that I suggested, at least can begin with that first enzyme that can copy itself and then go on to better things. And the first one can be very primitive, but because it's copying itself, and evolving, it can get better and better. Still have the problem, we don't yet have a full biochemical model right. for how an RNA molecule can be copied. Uh, the, I think the longest sequence that's been copied is five or six bases. Uh, it's better uh, than but, that. They're, oh, they're, close to 100. They're okay, close, close to 100. Well, well, by the time they're you get close to 100, we're getting there. But, but not the paper itself. came but out can't copy, year, it's can't can't copy itself. But, closer but, to but, you know, it will finally gotten to 100. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. at the time of the RNA world suggestion, there was nothing. Yeah. You know, <laughs> but hadn't true. copied one base, and people worried about what the, what the precursors were. So I, I'm encouraged by getting to 100 dramatically. Yeah. Uh, the other we... problem is the one that's mentioned, which I think there's still no solution to. Uh, where do the, how do you actually, in a prebiotic form, get to those RNA precursors? Right. Although progress is being made, so far there's nothing that's fully definitive. Because my, 
my confidence is both of these problems will get solved, mm -hmm. and sooner or later we'll have a test tube with little RNA molecules running around, making better copies of themselves, and we can try and try the whole thing all over again and see where we end up. <laughs> we Re might need it too. <laughs> <laughs> Rewind the tape, as Stephen Jay Gould said. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. So. All of this complicated machinery, this is like an engine. It takes energy to drive this. None of these are, are thermodynamically favorable, right? Copying RNAs and, and coding for proteins and stuff. Where does the energy come from to make this happen? Well, you're asking seriously? I'm out. <laughs> well, <laughs> it, it was, oh, okay, in order to make a polymer, or to make the RNA polymer, uh, the enzymology we use currently is uh, an enzymology based on triphosphates. So I have to make it, I make a triphosphate, I break off a diphosphate, and can polymerize the rest. A triphosphate of, of an adenine or a nucleic acid, Of a nucleotide. Nucleotide. In order to make that process actually work monodirectionality, I have to get rid of the diphosphate, and I've got to eliminate, other, eliminate that, otherwise the process is in equilibrium and I can't actually synthesize molecules. Right. So I have to have a source of energy to make what we like to call high energy compounds. Right. That can be solar energy, it could be any, it could be any one could conceive of any number of sources of that energy, mm -hmm. but I then have to then finally make polymers that takes energy. In order for the replication to continue to work and evolve, I've got to sort of run, I've got to freeze entropy. I've got, <laughs> I've got to prevent the general degradation. I have to have a source of energy coming in. I have to have some process that makes complicated structures, which I can do using that energy. And then I have to have some process that is evolution to keep, to keep the structures going. Mm -hmm. I do have to have energy. Yes. I do have to, and I do have to, I need something that provides um, multiplication of molecules. Right? Um, oh, okay. <laughs> You're happy. <laughs> I'm happy. You're happy. Okay. Uh, I'm happy. Another topic that enters in, we talked a little bit about introns. Um, and uh, uh, about the same time, uh, several of you, uh, Francis Crick and Leslie Orgel once again, and Ford Doolittle, also. Um, published articles in the same issue of a journal, Journal of Molecular Biology. Uh, both articles noted that they were uh, uh, inspired or spurred by a recent book by Richard Dawkins called The Selfish Gene, which came out in 1976. Some of you may have read it. Uh, and they wrote about what we would call selfish non-genes, if I may. Um, both, and these, this is 1980, so right around the time that a lot of this, this exciting stuff is, is happening, split genes, the archaea, and, uh, and so forth. Um, so both the authorship and the timing suggest connections to the RNA world and to these discussions about introns. No? That was in Nature, by the way. It was in Nature? Right. Excuse me. <laughs> JMB is much too uh, slow to publish. <laughs> okay, <laughs> fair enough. I don't think there was actually much connection because, um, I mean, the, the notion that introns might be transposable elements didn't really come along yet. I think Tom Keller Smith might have been mooting it at about that time, but most people didn't pay a lot of attention to what Tom said okay. much of the time because he says so much. <laughs> um, this is Tom Cavalier Smith? Right. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. Uh -huh. So I, um, <laughs> I think the selfish DNA papers that Leslie and Francis and I and Carmen Sapienza published mm -hmm. simultaneously, thanks to the grace of Francis and Leslie actually, mm. um, were pretty much coming out of, out of having read Dawkins' book and being uh, bemused by the fact that A, people were talking about the evolution of bacterial, the transposable elements, in, in that same anticipatory way, which I always react against, which is that mm -hmm. these things exist so that in the future, the cell will be better off, and that just doesn't make right. sense. The important point is that evolution does not have evolution foresight. Evolution does not look ahead. Right. And, and furthermore, large amounts of eukaryotic 
nuclear genomes were now known to be consisted, consisted of repetitive DNA, which was at that time, I think, not quite yet realized that it was mostly transposable elements, but now we know that 45% or more of our genome is made up of transposable elements, which uh, Orgel and Crick and Sapiens and I argued were simply parasites there, mm -hmm. pieces of DNA that can multiply, multiply themselves. Mm -hmm. Then, um, when uh, the intron theory became more developed, then it was becoming apparent that there were no introns in bacteria and that it seemed um, more reason and that we knew that there were some group two introns, which now Phil Sharp had said were likely to be ancestral to the spliceosomal introns, the complex introns that eukaryotes have. Then Tom Cavalier Smith's theory, which was that introns came in as group two introns from mitochondria, part of the mitochondria, which are in the symbionts within the eukaryotic cells, that that was the origin of the introns that then went wild in the nuclear genome of eukaryotes. That's what I think most people, with the possible exception of Wally Gilbert, now believe. Um, mm -hmm. So that was the connection, but it wasn't connection through the RNA world, it was connection through, I mean, there was no RNA world part to that. Uh-huh, okay. Is there a partial exception to Wally Gilbert? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I think you, you believe that some introns are late, too. I don't think you probably have a all introns early view. Well, yes, a few may be late. But a that's few, <laughs> okay. That's not, that's not very much. So, so, so Wally's a holdout on this one. Yeah. Okay. And so would you say there's consensus around the idea that introns were present in the first genomes? The first RNA genome. No, there's a consensus that introns were present in the first eukaryotic, the last common eukaryotic ancestral cell okay. was replete with many introns, okay. supposedly. Most people think that the only introns that were ever in prokaryotes were uh, simpler introns, in particular the group two ones, mm -hmm. which according to a theory of Phil Sharp, which had the lovely theory, uh, title of five easy pieces, a group two intron leaped from the mitochondrial genome of an invading bacterium into the nuclear genome of the host, fell into five different parts, and spread either before or after falling well, what, apart. What was this doing in the mitochondrial genome of the invading bacterium? Well, it's a, I mean, group two introns are, are mobile transposable elements in bacteria, too. They're just not, so, they, but they, I mean, they're restricted in where they can go because they will interfere with translation in a, in a prokaryote. So there, there are not that many of them. But once they were into the nucleated eukaryotic cell, they could go crazy. Okay. That's the theory. Look, a little background. The, the, uh, plant <laughs> yeah, cells, I mean, of course, have chloroplasts, which are the photosynthesizing elements that give them their energy. And animal cells have inside them mitochondria, which are the little engines that, that provide energy for animal cells, right? And the idea is that those were actually little microbes themselves at one point early on, and that they were engulfed by another yeah, cell. Yeah. Yeah, I, sorry, yes, I was, I was going pretty fast there. Yeah. I mean, that, that is perhaps the only thing that everybody in the field of molecular evolution would believe, which is that mitochondria descend from bacteria which were engulfed by a cell that didn't have mitochondria and deriving, therefore, the benefit of uh, aerobic respiration and that chloroplasts in plants derive from what used to be called blue-green algae and are now called cyanobacteria, a kind of bacterium, which in, and those were engulfed by those organisms that became plants uh, to provide the benefits of, benefit of the photosynthesis. But that, what that's after the eukaryotic cell That would be, well, now there's a big debate there as to whether, well, the chloroplasts definitely after, whether or not mitochondria was after the development of a complex eukaryotic cell, in which case, according to the theory of Tom Kevlar Smith, the introns came in with that mitochondrion, or whether the mitochondrial invasion was at the very beginning of the formation of eukaryotic cells, uh -huh. is a huge debate, which if you're going to talk to Bill Martin next month, 
you'll hear about. <laughs> exactly. But this well, has to be before the plant animal divergence. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, okay. well, yeah. well before plants and animals split right. off. This is the common ancestor. There's one, one possible clarification yeah. some in the audience might. Mm -hmm. yeah. when in, the, in the bacterial cell, when the messenger RNA is made, the ribosomes attach to it immediately and begin translating it. So there's no opportunity to remove the intron. Whereas in the eukaryotic cell, the, the messenger RNA is made in the nucleus and can sit there for several hours before it's ultimately transported into the cytoplasm. So, and so there's the opportunity to re remove the introns which occurs in the nucleus. And things. So the prokaryotes don't have that. Right. That, that. That's right, but the alternative argument on this is that the reason that the messenger RNA is translated immediately in the protein is a very developed end product of evolution and right. what the original prokaryotic cell mm -hmm. looked that, like. That, that, that's mm -hmm. fine, but I'm just yep. trying to clarify this. No, I, I just want to make sure we, right. we have all of that argument. I mean, I'm not sure yeah. I agree with that, but, but I, <laughs> I wasn't talking about that. Right. Oh, and the, the last thing that might need clarification is a transposon, which is a bit, which uh, colloquially is called a jumping gene. It's act there are actually segments of DNA that can cut themselves out of a chromosome and then reinsert in another spot. And those were uh, initially discovered by Barbara McClintock, who I, I, I wrote about, and uh, then were discovered independently in bacteria in the late 1960s. That's right, but although you should also emphasize for the audience that the transposon is cut out of the DNA by having enzymes, special, by making special enzymes that cut it out and do that. Mm -hmm. Whereas when we were talking about the RNA world and introns going in and out, we we're talking about self catalyzed right. introns. Right. These are introns that can actually cut themselves out without needing extra enzymes. Right? That's, what made it, that's what made it special. Um, before we move right. on to, uh, did you want to say something? No, no, I'm going, going to go back to the RNA world. Please. <laughs> <laughs> so the, uh, the discovery of, of the two ribozymes by Tom Cech and Sid Altman uh, were a, a, a huge uh, development in the notion of the RNA world. Here was an information molecule that could also be catalytic and, and cause a, a, a reaction just like a protein enzyme could. But the real, I think, fundamental thing that changed the, uh, the direction of the field was the realization that ribosomal RNA, the RNA that's involved in this machine that does the translation of messenger RNA information into proteins, the RNA itself is capable to form that, the, uh, the, uh, the bond between amino acids. And before that, the thought was this complicated ribosome with, a, with three RNA molecules in it, lots of proteins in it, that it was very complicated and it was probably the proteins that were doing everything. Well, through a, a longish series of experiments, Harry Knoller showed that, in fact, the RNA alone is capable of catalyzing that very fundamental reaction of linking two amino acids together, which all life absolutely has to depend on. So here's this most fundamental process in our living world today that, in fact, is catalyzed by RNA itself. To, to me, that was the fundamental uh, observation that said, wait a minute, this RNA world has to be real. Yeah. Uh, and what has happened, I think, in the period since then is a, an explosion of the number of roles that RNA molecules of right. all sizes and shapes play in our cells today from long RNA molecules made from what some would call junk DNA uh, can be <laughs> processed and, uh, and used uh, to uh, control the activity of genes, small RNA molecules that are involved in splicing out introns, an incredible collection. The most intriguing to me is the, their involvement in a bacterial immunity system where bacteria uh, uh, sense a, a, a say a virus that infects the bacterium, it makes a little RNA copy of bits and pieces from the genome of that virus, stores that information away in its own bacterial genome, and next time that bacterium gets infected by uh, a virus of, that, that has been seen before, it, the uh, RNA molecule made off of the genome version that's been stored is activated and it goes and it destroys the incoming DNA. So here's an, an RNA-based immunity system uh, in most bacteria. Truly amazing. 
It really so this is. explosion of different functions um, really uh, is a, a, a real tribute, I think, to the fundamental nature of RNA. And having worked in the RNA business all along, I'm, uh, I've always respected DNA and its <laughs> storage uh, and its permanent uh, ability to do that, but it's pretty boring yeah. compared to RNA. <laughs> yeah, the, you know, the, the field is getting, uh, the RNA field is getting very exciting. Uh, when I wrote the RNA world paper, I expected people would find a series of RNA-based enzymes of all kinds. And I've been actually disappointed that so far that hasn't happened. Uh, the, as Ray said, the most striking RNA enzyme is the critical one that makes all proteins possible, which is, a, I agree, a strong reason for thinking there's some fundamental truth in the RNA world picture. I want to make another comment, though, because we, we talked about the introns and exons. Mm -hmm. We talked a bit, I mentioned with the exon shuffling. That is a notion that you, it's related to the fact that when you look at eukaryotic genes, you find portions of the genes that have, that prescribe specific functions to proteins, often separated out on separate exons and often reused in other genes. So that the role of the intron exon structure, at least the eukaryotic cell, very much, there are a number of cases in which you can show, yes, it is clear that that structure has been used to combine the exons in novel forms to make new genes, which was the idea behind the role of introns as a recombination enhancer and to shuffle the exons. I think that's true, and that's true. I mean, yeah. It is true. Yeah, right. Oh, there's good data. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I don't want the audience to be left in the impression yeah. that from oh, our oh, nature of oh, discussion, oh. no, that doesn't happen. Yeah. That does oh, happen. Oh, it's a sure. good thing. But the question of what happened in early evolution, then, uh, different. much trickier. It's a different question. question. Related, but different. Yeah. <laughs> Goes back to how we made the prokaryotic genes yeah. in the first place. Right. And yeah. one of the great force behind the intron exon right. idea is the idea you made protein genes from small pieces. Right. And you didn't have the problem of assembling 200 amino acids into a single gene. You could find 20 amino acid pieces that might have function and then put those together later into a more complicated gene. And the argument that you never did this in the prokaryotic structure does leave you with a problem. Oh. How did I make triosphosphatase no, oh, well, in that first, well, actually, in that early cell? Those of us apostates from introns early, like me, <laughs> <laughs> nevertheless believe what you just said, that, that it, A, that exon shuffling in the modern world happens a lot, and B, that genes might well have been put together from smaller pieces in, in the early pre-genomic stage. What we're not sure of is there's any connection between that and now, whether or not what you that's right, says that's that's right. See, I, I, that's right. I do think you see shadows of this yeah. in the structure of genes, but and we yeah. can disagree. Right. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I want to move on a little bit to the, the articulation of the, uh, of the RNA world theory proper. Um, Wally, the, the year you published the RNA World article, that summer, uh, as, at least as I read it, you got together with, um, with Jim Watson and Jeremy Knowles to plan a meeting at Cold Spring Harbor, the, the symposium the next year. At least that's what Jim wrote in the introduction to the, to the volume. <laughs> well, it was written at the time. It's probably better than my memory. <laughs> of the do, do, to that. do you recall that, that meeting and, and what prompted it? No. No? <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Name the meet with, with this is the already seven meetings? The, the, the 1987 Cold Spring yeah. Harbor Symposium meeting on uh, catalytic function in RNA. Yeah. Oh. Huh? Well, the, 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 the general, the symposium in 87 was on evolution, was it not? I mean, the thick one, you've got a, that's where the yeah. Exxon Theory of Genes was published. Exactly. Yeah, okay, so that that's, be, that's, that's what right. I'm talking about. That was the, the annual symposium. Right. The, the annual symposium. Yes. Um, I certainly wasn't aware. <laughs> I, I, was, I was there, and I remember. I remember writing a paper for it okay. afterwards. I must have talked about well, the idea. Well, you must have right. made I always wrote papers afterwards. <laughs> you must have made an impression because I remember some. I didn't go to that meeting, and I remember somebody came and told me said, "The original life problem has been solved." <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> the RNA, and, so, and they were very excited about the RNA world and all this yeah. that had been discussed at that meeting, and so and it revolutionized 
if nothing else, grant funding in the origin of <laughs> <laughs> Very important. Yeah. So um, Cold Spring Harbor meetings have this kind of iconic status uh, in, the, in the biological science community. Um, do me a favor, set the stage for us all about Cold Spring Harbor, what it's like, what the symposium is, how, how it works. So I was there for a long time. Yes. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's an amazing place. It's, a, it's on the north shore of Long Island, and it's a sort of uh, poor little lab set in the middle of a very wealthy neighborhood uh, where the wealthy neighbors invite us funny scientists over for amusement at dinner time. This is literally great Gatsby territory, yes. right? Yes. I mean, it's, yeah. honestly. It's amazing. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but it was, it, be, it was really the, the crossroads of molecular biology during the whole growth of molecular biology. That's where everybody would come through sometime in the summer. They would run a series of courses and meetings throughout the summer. Uh, and uh, I found there, I, I didn't have to read the journals at all because someone would come through and tell me whatever was happening long before it turned up in a journal. Giving you much so more it was time a, for that. Real luxury. Yeah. Um, uh, and it has, it's continued that. And it has the, the, the feature, main feature, is an annual symposium that it has early in the summer every year. Uh, that is, uh, it's really a command performance. If you're invited to go to that symposium, you go to that symposium and they publish a big volume uh, of all the things that happened at that uh, symposium. And looking at that collection of papers is really a great history of, of this whole period of, uh, of molecular biology from the early 60s uh, up till now. There's it's a remarkable, remarkable sort of prescience to many of those meetings. They seemed to know what was just on the verge of happening. Yeah, that was one of the key things, picking the right topic at the yeah. right time. Yeah, that's right. Uh, the, and this was one of them. Yeah, that was a good oh, thing. Well, I, well, the one actually before the, the, the uh, splicing was announced at a symposium. Yes. And it was announced as a surprise. Yep. I was, <laughs> was, at, it a I was at the symposium. Yeah, was, those talks were a great, a great surprise. They <laughs> kept the secret. You know, they broke, and so both groups actually broke the, the splicing story in one evening session. I, I remember it at, at a symposium. Now, the discovery of the splicing was a, a huge competition between one scientist, Rich Roberts at Cold Spring Harbor, and Phil Sharp at MIT, who had just yeah. left Cold Spring Harbor to go to MIT. So this is a, a real rivalry. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, uh, so, so what's a Cold Spring Harbor symposium like? What's it like? Yeah. Deteriorated. Oh. But <laughs> <laughs> where, does, where does the real work get done? You know, what's it? Well, it, it, it's well, an intimidating uh, venue because you know all, of, all of the professionals are there. And they range from people that sit in the front row and get agitated and ask questions to Jim Watson who would sit in the back reading a newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> Loudly. <laughs> Loudly. Yeah. Right. And the, 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 worse, picture, picture the worse the, the talk, the more you don't hold <laughs> yeah. on the newspaper. Uh, but um, I can remember uh, uh, Francis Crick drawing on the, the chalkboard is RNA makes, uh, DNA makes RNA makes protein. And there's an awful lot of history in that institution. Yes, yeah, yeah. That's and, right, the messenger RNA, some um, papers were in the symposium in 1961, mm -hmm. my, my first exposure there. And um, I guess was I, yeah, I didn't talk at that one. Um, Francois Go probably gave our paper, and Sidney Brenner gave mm -hmm. that, the other yep. paper. And Sidney is talking about the messenger RNA and saying how wonderful the idea is, and it's such a wonderful secret. And Shargaff's voice comes out from the background, the back of the symposium. Sidney has just said it's this, this hermetic idea. Shargaff shouts out, you've forgotten that Hermes is the god of thieves. <laughs> 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 the Messenger idea was not immediately accepted by the chemical community at that time. <laughs> this is Erwin Shargaff, a notoriously cranky and brilliant uh, scientist at the Rockefeller. Yeah, um, that's a great story. So the um, the nineteen eighty seven symposium had uh, was a particularly wide ranging 
meaning. There's a, a, looking through the table of contents, it's just, it's just stunning. There are a whole lot of figures who are very important people in origin of life research. Um, uh, there are chemists, there are uh, uh, biologists, you know, molecular biologists, microbiologists, uh, theoretical scientists. How did that all work? Watson said again in the introduction that he, was, he had been afraid that it would be too broad to really get discussion going. Do you, do you remember the discussion? And you know, was it hard to talk to? Did, did people form little camps? Or how did it work? I wasn't there. You weren't there. I was certainly what? there. You should have. You should have. You had a paper you should, in it. You should have shown me the book beforehand. I, would have <laughs> <laughs> we, we, I could, uh, you know, had I looked, had I looked through that table of contents, it I'm, might. I have it here well, if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I can look through it. I, I could, it would probably refresh my memory. I mean, I certainly wrote a paper in it, and it would have been part of all those discussions. But I can't remember yeah. anything. No, you, that's what that, the exon theory of genes was there. That, that was exactly. the exon theory of yeah. genes. And I, and I had you I had the paper on Daryl Rainey. Daryl Rainey was there too, actually. Daryl Rainey was there. Ray, you gave the paper on on slipping and sliding and jumping. Oh, yeah. and my yes, my uh, colleague did that. Oh. Okay, okay. So you were no, not at the right. at the meeting. Okay. And one of the, one of the, the, the separate things about these. The books is that the papers are often written after the symposium. Mm -hmm. the, so the, it, the most important thing is to get your picture in the front, right? Because <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that shows you there. People are there, and then they appear in the front part of the book. That's right. Yeah. The, I mean, the meeting is very enjoyable, but you know, scientists <laughs> rarely prepare papers ahead of time. Mm. You know, we're different from other fields, and we we talk freely, and then occasionally write it up afterwards. Okay. I took a bunch of those pictures, and I have some very Did embarrassing you? ones, if you're interested. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see those. Yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> Here's the table of contents, if you want to take a look while we chat. <laughs> OK, you can ask him some other questions. I'll see yeah, Blake, yeah. What I Blake was okay. there, too. There was quite a lot on the Exxon, Exxon Intron stuff. Yes. Yes, there were. Um, and Ford, you had a, a very interesting paper about introns and hierarchy in genome evolution. And you were, as I read the paper, you were talking about evolution at different levels of the uh, the, the the genes, the organism, the population. Yeah. Well, that's one of my hobby horses, um, and that's partly what selfish DNA was about too, because. Right. I mean, the theory of evolution is a very general one. It basically says if you have replicating things, which have heredity so that the children resemble the parents, and they have variation between them so that some of them are different than other ones, and that variation affects how many children they go on to have, how fit they are, then you will have evolution by natural selection. So organisms are the premier example of that, things which have heritable variation and fitness. but. But genes do too, and that's what the selfish DNA idea is based on. And, I'm, and species do too, in a way. Species have a, something like birth. They have speciation. They give rise to new species. And they also have something like death, namely they can go extinct. So mm -hmm. that means there are some things which species have which are like traits, which are selected for at the level of species. Many people think that sex is sexual reproduction is one of those things which is selected for at the level of species, even though it's disadvantageous to the individual. It's much more economical just to give birth to children without having to have a mate. But, right. but, <laughs> but it just doesn't last that long. No, it doesn't last. Yes, indeed. The yeah. species go extinct as a result of right. it because there's not the resorting <laughs> genetic reasons. information. But it would be advantageous to the individual. So I, that's still a, a hobby horse of mine. And, and, um, I'm, and so I thought that there is a sense in which introns speed evolution, but it isn't that organisms have introns so that they themselves will evolve. It's that species that have more introns will evolve better than species that don't have introns. So in a sense, introns are like sex. They're something which are good for the species and maybe make it speciate more effectively or go extinct less often because it can generate innovations. But they're actually detrimental to the individual. Now, does this go against the idea of group selection? 
it is a group selectionist idea, but there are. Uh -huh. I, I, I always hate such ideas. Hmm? I said I always hate such ideas. I know so you I'm, do. Like, but, just but, make, you're just making my state position uh, clear. But, but group selection, there's two kinds of group selection. There's the kind that people worry about within species, whether or not altruism is possible. That's called multi-level selection type one. Uh -huh. And then there's whether things like species you know, if we believe there's a hierarchy of nature, if we believe that there are genes and then there's cells and there's organisms and there's species, different levels of the hierarchy, and each of those has something that's comparable to heredity, something that's comparable to variation, and something that's comparable to fitness, then natural selection will occur at each of those levels independently. And yeah. I believe that. Yeah. Um, it's a, it's but, a very interesting yeah, idea. Yeah. And you don't like it. But so, so introns would be then advantageous at the higher level than the individual. Uh-huh. OK. You see, I, I view the introns as simply left over in the individual because they were of use in the past. Well, now, both of those things yeah. can be true. They, yes. They're not mutually. That, that's right, actually. But okay. I, don't, I don't see the need for invoking group selection as opposed to just the evolutionary course that leads to the individual. Right. Mm -hmm. you, you would be in the majority in that. OK. <laughs> Okay. No, that's an accident. <laughs> <laughs> George and Ray, how, do you want to weigh in on, on this question? Do you, do you agree with the, this idea of, of selection operating on different, different levels? Yeah, it sounds reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> I, not, nothing. <laughs> I, was, I was just thinking about, though, in, in the prokaryotes, we, you know, we have a little RNA we're working with right now, it has a, it has a big, compared to, compared to its relatives and other organisms, it has 108 nucleotide insertion. Mm -hmm. And that insertion apparently doesn't interfere with the function, so it, it just can mm -hmm. preserve. So if you figured out a way to get rid of it, you would have discovered intron splicing, right? Mm -hmm. if the, if the, but the organism doesn't need to get rid of it, it's just baggage, I guess, but, but I mean really junk. just kind of a thought, yeah, junk DNA. But then junk DNA can then subsequently become useful for some reason. I mean, that's what's happened with the eukaryotic ribosomal RNAs. They're bigger, and it turns out that the extra bigger stuff is just like this prokaryotic case, an insertion, and in some cases now we discover that these insertions are actually doing something, not related, you know, regulatory things or something. Yeah. So. And what fascinates well, me about, about this is that, you know, we, the, I think the popular notion is that DNA is the kind of essence of life, right? Mm -hmm. you, know, we, you see it in the car ads and in the, you know, the perfumes and sodas and whatnot. And really, when you get into RNA, it's everywhere. It, it, it almost feels like this is really the heart of, of living things. Huh? Well, I, I, I think those are unfair, unfair <laughs> questions. I mean, you know, there is, a, there, there's, there is a set of questions which the RNA world directed at. How does life begin? How does the complicated life begin? Yeah. What mm -hmm. the first cells possibly look like? How do we get there? Yeah. There's a sort of question in biology, how does the cell really function? How do our bodies function? Mm -hmm. Part of the answer to that is, yes, things like, oh, RNA is a great big important part of that, as are all the protein enzymes and all these things. Mm -hmm. And there are all sorts of games in cancer treatment in which people are looking at the microRNAs and saying, oh, this little RNA, 100 bases long, elevated in a tumor, that's serious, and we should try to devise drugs that will affect that. Uh, there's another level in which well, you know, um, our inheritance is, is the DNA. And that's what we pass down to our children, and that's mm -hmm. the way our bodies work in terms of the immediate evolution. Sure. Um, in fact, along those thoughts, I, was, I don't want to leave the audience with a feeling that evolution is perfect. Evolution is a process of selection, but it does not necessarily ever get to peaks of perfection. Right. Selection can only work in a local sense, and so you can get to local maximum. You get to re regions that things work reasonably, and then you evolve something else around here, and you get somewhere else that things work reasonably. But that doesn't mean the organism is perfect in any sense. Right. And the organism has all sorts of imperfections, appendices, introns, all sorts of things floating <laughs> around. Once of use, now not of use, possibly disappearing, 
mm. possibly at some moment being caught upon by evolution to do something else and appears, appears again. The rate of mutation in our cells is determined by evolutionary processes and is in fact optimized. It's neither too high nor too low. It's a, a rate that seems to work for evolution that makes evolution run at a rate that's fast enough so that the overall sweep of evolution works. It's the Goldilocks rate. But we're not perfect, yes. you know, and yes. one could imagine, and biochemists often did, you could imagine better genes, better ways of copying DNA more accurately, all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Turns out evolution doesn't do that. Yeah. Maybe you could explain what would happen if evolution were too fast or too slow. Um, well, we wish we knew. <laughs> Sometimes too slow you can tell. I mean, the, the evolution is too slow, the or organism cannot uh, the environment changes and the organism simply cannot change fast enough. Right. Right. Extinction. Uh, species, a species is not a unique structure. A species like ourselves, for example, contains all sorts of different types of individuals because the genes that make up a species are, have a large number of variations inside that species. And so when the evolution, the world changes, those individuals in a species that are well adapted to that particular future niche expand. And other parts of the species, other individual species die out. And the species, if you're looking at its chain, overall chain, changes its space, shape becomes taller, shorter. Global warming will affect our species. And those of us that are more heat tolerant will be in a better shape. We need fast evolution. And we uh, will have a reasonably yeah. fast evolution. And that sort of evolution actually is quite fast. Our species is quite varied, and we have members of the species that are tolerant to high temperatures and other right. members that are tolerant to low temperatures. And if the world... We can all move to Canada. If the world... <laughs> if the world yeah, so, so, some of us have already yeah. proceeded, you see. We're already <laughs> established in Canada and ready for the future. <laughs> Yes, the faster the environment changes, the faster you need to evolve to keep right. up with it, right? Uh, maybe we could say just a little bit about the RNA World Book and how that came about. Did, did it grow out of the 1987 symposium? Uh, in a sense, but it was really my colleague John Atkins and I had been involved in the RNA research for, for years, and the uh, the realization that ribosomal RNA was catalytic and the other um, the catalytic uh, examples um, just made us think, wouldn't it be uh, great to get all those two fields in one book? The early RNA evolution folks that worried about where did nucleotides from come from, how could you replicate, how could RNA replicate itself, get them in the same book with people describing all the novel new things that RNA could do. Uh, with the hope that these groups would start talking to each other more, uh, and that uh, by uh, getting the uh, folks working on the, the uh, RNA world to look at the modern RNA uh, and the intricate things it can do and the ways it can do them uh, as a way to help guide thinking about the RNA world. Uh, and uh, we, we knew a lot of the folks in the, in the current RNA world and rounded up the other folks, and there was great enthusiasm to put this book together. And then the RNA, work on RNA was uh, evolving so rapidly that we had to put out a new edition and a new edition and a new edition. So it, uh, it was great fun, actually, and I think it has had some impact on the, on, on the world. But. Well, one, of, one of the best features of the book is the appendix that, was, that shows the diagrams of all possible canonical base pairs that make two or right. more hydrogen bonds. Very, very useful. Yeah, there, is, <laughs> there are three or four append appendices that are very information rich like that. Yeah, yeah. 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 It, it's one of those books who, when you, if you look at the various editions, as I, as I have done, the, uh, it's, it's clear that these were not simply just, you know, like a lot of books, it's just, oh, it's been a few years, the, the copyright's running out, let's put out a new edition. It, it, it really is a dynamic book. The, the volumes are, are different, and they, they really reflect changes in the field. Yeah, I think that's what it reflects. Things were changing faster, so people couldn't just say the same old thing. Yeah. 
but mm -hmm. I should point out that Tom Check joined John Atkins and I on the second and third and fourth edition. Right, the, yeah. The three of us. Yeah. yeah. How, how did he get involved? I mean, I know he was involved in the, obviously, in the... Uh, I'll uh, tell you the truth. The uh, Atkins and I asked him to contribute a chapter for volume two, and he said, sure, if you'll make me an editor. <laughs> <laughs> but he was a, an obvious one to add because he had uh, yeah. great connections in that world. Sure, yeah. Well, it was well, a wonderful addition to the book. One, one of the things I'd like to know is you managed to get both Crick and Watson, ah. one to do a preface and the other to do, anyway, you call them different things, but you managed to get them both right forwards oh. to the book. How did you accomplish well, that? This actually may be the only time that they've published together, right. certainly that I know of, that they've been back to back in one volume. But they both were uh, eager to do it, uh, and it was, they, uh, it was so wonderful that we put those same uh, uh, forwards in, in all four editions of the book. But yeah. they are amusing to read. Jim talks about his early involvement in messenger RNA and ribosomes, and Francis talks uh, in detail about uh, the various chapters of the book and what it says about the RNA world. It's fun reading. Yeah, yeah it really is. Okay. Uh, in just a moment, we're going to open it up to, uh, to questions. But just to kind of wrap up, um, and we've actually touched on a couple of little bits of this, but uh, where is the RNA world today? What has it, how has it changed the way we think about where we come from? Well, I think it's, it's at least provided a logical way to think about how we could have evolved this DNA world. Uh, to me, it's the most logical way to look at how it could have happened. It doesn't mean it's right. It's an idea, uh, unproven for sure. Uh, but it's, a, uh, it's, it's one that is approachable, and, and we can work at it and learn a whole lot more uh, about the world we're in, in addition to maybe uh, learning about our very early origins. Yeah. Yeah. I think that underscores the fact that science is oftentimes more about asking questions than it is about getting answers. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Other well, thoughts? I, I think, you know, when you talked at the beginning about it being a solution to the chicken and egg problem, I'm, I mean, I think most of us do believe in the RNA world in some way. We also would agree that there are the two problems that George mentioned. One is that there isn't yet a self-replicating RNA, although I think most of us believe that there will be. <laughs> and, and B, there... You don't need it. <laughs> there, is, there, is a, there is the problem of how did you get to the RNA in the first place? Or right. Was there some other That's, polymer before uh, that? that you, you guys are really good at anticipating but, the next question. Oh, but, but mostly, yeah. I don't think people in my area care about that. That's chemistry, right? And, but, but I think it's, it's, so it's what, what philosophers call a how possibly explanation. Before that, we were baffled as how it could have happened. Now, mm -hmm. it could have happened this way, right? Whether it did happen this way, I don't think we will ever actually know. But we're no longer uh, stymied by how could it possibly have originated. It could have possibly origin, originated like this. Yeah. And I think most of us now believe that, right? Well, yeah. Yeah. But the question of the RNA replicase, the alternative is a protein replicase. Right. And we actually have proteins that can replicate RNA. They're called polymerases, right? <laughs> yeah. And so, so the fundamental yeah. question is, if you have a ribosome early on that's making peptides, how complex does that peptide have to be to become a polymerase? And so while we're searching for the RNA replicase, maybe we should be searching for the peptide replicase. Now, the problem is, experimentally, it's much, much more difficult. To, yeah. to develop, you know, get, create random peptides and, and t assay them mm -hmm. and stuff. But that's why you're um, going to do it. No, I'm yeah. not going to do it. <laughs> it, could, it could be done. You know, yeah. we, have, we have the technology to create random peptides. No, 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 another thing which hasn't been mentioned, which it probably should be, is the work of Mike Yaris. And, and he has actually, under prebiotic conditions, created very, very small RNAs of four or five residues which, where, where one can catalyze the attachment of amino acid to another. Mm. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. these very, very small things. And, and I think he's even showed that you can t get a few of these together and you can even make a peptide bond. So I don't know that you, your original RNA doesn't necessarily have to be 200 residues. Hmm. You get interesting right. things happening with much smaller RNAs. One interesting aspect of this is that we, we're starting to see where 
research on the origin of life four billion years ago starts to intersect with the very cutting edge field of synthetic biology and trying to create life in the laboratory. And the information that's being gleaned out of this research is feeding into some very high tech, you know, biotechnology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, thank you. I think with that, we should probably uh, open it up to questions. What we're going to do is we have two microphones here and here, and you can just line up uh, in front of the microphone. If you have a question, <laughs> feel free, uh, stand up, and, and please just, just come up and line up, and, uh, and we'll just take you as you come. Oh, yes, my name is uh, Ronald Wilson. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you. If, if I may... Um, as, as Ron did, please uh, do identify yourself uh, when you come up. Thank you. Yes, uh, my name is Ronald Wilson. I work for the federal government. I, I do some research on uh, origins of life. Uh, and you all did touch upon uh, synthetic creation of, uh, of life uh, in the laboratory. And I was wondering, uh, based upon what you all know of uh, evolution, uh, natural selection, and uh, also RNA and uh, DNA, do you think it will ever be possible uh, or feasible in the future, whether it's near term or long term, to actually uh, create life in the laboratory? That was a nice segue. Mm. <laughs> yes. I, yes. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Jack Shostak is going to do it soon, right? Oh, he's, he's well I think Jack? Uh, it, it means, yes, I think so. I mean, there's a great... From, Listen. It again, in some ways, it's a, it's a question that depends on our definition of what is life. Uh, exactly. Uh, to the extent that okay. I'd be delighted to see a RNA molecule that can copy itself and continually copying and mutate to better things, to, better, to do that process better and better, I would consider that an interesting first step on a on an evolution of life. To actually get that RNA molecule into a cell and self-sustaining, that's still harder. Yes. We don't even have that very first one yet. We don't know where the precursors to that really come from. Um, on the other hand, I'm quite confident that we will eventually get there, that we will get a, mo a, model, of, or a model organism that can evolve replicate itself, evolve to better things. To actually create an organism that looks like a bacteria or looks like the original cell is going to be quite difficult. I, I, agree. I can't, I can't right. resist. Again, that turns on, there's, there's turns on the, the speed of evolution. You said laboratory, and I'm not sure what your definition of laboratory is, but there is a whole other possibility of artificial life, and it's with computers. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Right. I mean, there's well, a lot of exciting, a you know, the possibility of a self-aware computer of some sort is not, it's being thought, it's being thought about and talked about. And so that's another life, right? This artificial life or something, it's just not in the laboratory. Well, how would you know it's self-aware? Well, <laughs> that, that is a, part, a major issue in the whole discussion, actually, is, is yeah. what is self-aware? You ask. And, yeah. right. and if it answers, <laughs> yeah. how do I know I'm self-aware? I mean, how do you know I'm self-aware? That's <laughs> but, but, but that's really being very actively discussed mm -hmm. and taken seriously. Yes. Okay. Yes, hi. Hi. Uh, Tom Baird, and I hope this question is not unfortunate, but... Um, <laughs> From the perspective of these early RNA replication environments, we know that pH and solute concentration is extremely important. Do you envision some kind of enveloping situation occurring around the nucleic acid, or this is just being a free environment like perhaps a pool of water? Certainly not the ocean, I wouldn't imagine, but what are your thoughts on, on the actual physiological conditions surrounding the RNA early in replication? Well, it's actually a very difficult question. I mean, there's a sort of simple answer in which I think in the 86 paper, I imagined little puddles of water and doing that. And um, Dan Jay then got inspired to say, well, maybe the first membranes will be um, uh, positively charged polymers that you can then use to wrap nucleic acids. And we even did a little experiment to show, yes, it makes a little sense. Um, I do 
fundamentally agree that as to have a something that we're going to call any sort of proto-organism, it's going to have to have a boundary, some way of separating and permitting the improvements that develop in the replication to, to um, pass to daughter organisms, you're going to have to have some sort of structure. But, you know, I think the ideas about the structure are at least as primitive as the ideas about how to actually make the self-replicating RNA molecule. Harold Morowitz over at uh, George Mason would say you, you have to have a membrane. Well, that's part of what Jack Shostak is doing now, is trying to get right. things that replicate right. within a membrane structure. Yeah. So yeah. Uh -huh. that's why I'm putting my money on him. Okay. I would too. Yeah? <laughs> yeah? Okay. Yes, uh, hi. Hi. My name is Mary Fraker, and when I first started listening to this, I was wondering, well, what on earth good is DNA? I mean, RNA is doing everything. And is it because, you know, and so why would it still be around if it wasn't doing anything? But is it because it's so capable of store? it's like a library, it's so, the genomes could get longer and more complicated and we could all be here talking because the DNA was able to store that much information? And then my other part of the question is, um, were any of you in the RNA tie club? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm afraid the answer is we weren't in the RNA tie club. We're all a little, a little later than that, that group. Yeah. Um, your, your question is quite, is absolutely right. Um, I think our conception of the role of DNA is completely that of a much larger information store, a much more accurate one. Yep. Uh, we know of a large, I mean, DNA, DNA today uses a large number of error correcting devices to preserve the information. And where we have RNA genomes functioning in viruses today, they are not as accurately copied. They have about a one part in a thousand error rate, whereas the error rate in DNA is down around one part in 10 to the sixth, one part in 10 to the, 10 to the seventh. And the specific, I mean, there, there are lots of specific reasons for that and detailed models for how, how that actually happens. But Wally, RNA could have evolved might have evolved. It might have evolved to do that. We do not. Those same error correction mechanisms. But it is intrinsically less stable. Right. So it, it is, is chemical. We don't, we don't know what it's, you don't know, you don't know what's caused and what's effective. In a sense, you don't know whether, <clears throat> yes. yes, you could have evolved it to be more, uh, to have the error correction mechanisms, and you could have evolved a um, pH balance in the cell that keeps the RNA stable. Yeah. But, but certainly that one hydroxyl group difference makes a very big difference in the chemical activity of, mm -hmm. of the molecule. Yes. yes. It's a great question to be asking in the Library of Congress, though, I think this is. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. DNA, is yes. DNA is a fantastic library. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and yeah. uh, it's, it's very inertness as part of the, the, the value, right? There's, there's now an, an effort to look at storing books information, a whole book in DNA in sequences. DNA. Yeah. You yeah. synthesize DNA in, in any sequence you want. You can do that now. And you can encode all the information digitally that you're interested in doing into this four-letter code and store it away someplace where it's stable and lasts a long time. And then when you want it, you just read it out and you get the book back. Mm -hmm. So this but is if, you put, if you put enough copies down. I mean, we have managed to read yeah. DNA from 20 million years. Yes occasionally, at least a million years, at least yep. lo longer than books have lasted so yes, far. So longer far. than papyrus. Hmm? It's like cave painting. <laughs> well, cave painting is 30,000 years, but I was thinking of, we have read the Neanderthal sequence, yep. which is probably 100,000 to several hundred thousand years, and we have occasionally, I think, we covered plant genes, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly, and I yeah. think that's about 20 million. Yeah. Yeah. The, although, it, although, as I said, lots of copies because lots of damage gets done right, over that right. time. You need redundancy. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, Aparna Kishore. Uh, Dr. Gilbert mentioned something that I was curious about, which is the role of viruses in, in the interplay between the uh, evolution of an RNA genome or the conversion from an RNA world to a DNA world. And I was wondering what your, what your thoughts on this might be. I was talking about introns. I'm not sure I talked about viruses. Um, I think what? You didn't. She wants you to. Oh, what? Good for you. 
I'm not, I'm not sure I can say anything useful. Uh, in some ways, <laughs> on this scale that we're talking, the, the viruses, you know, I'm happy to talk about bacteria as highly evolved streamlined organisms. The viruses are even better evolved streamlined organisms. Um, they, they, um, the one place in which they play a role in our genome is actually the thing that um, you were mentioning. Before. Um, the, re the, um, the RNA viruses uh, provide sources of DNA that then copied back into DNA provide sources of DNA that then are in multiple copies in our genomes. Um, but that's mostly a later phenomenon, I would think, in evolution. So I don't have any, anything to really say about early evolution. But doesn't this also bear on uh, lateral gene transfer? Hmm. Well, well, people always ask about viruses and the origin of life and the tree of life, and, and it's really not clear what you can say about that because it seems, I would guess, that most modern viruses are relatively modern evolutionary inventions. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that there couldn't have been virus-like things in the past, and almost certainly, you know, in an RNA world, um, and, and in fact, in the vitro RNA evolution virus. shows this. If, if you ever did get a self an, an RNA that could replicate itself and other RNAs, then other RNAs which, whose only function was to be replicated by this replicase, but which could not themselves replicate, would evolve, right? I mean, the mm -hmm. parasites. Yep. And, and that sort of thing happens all the time, and you, those would be analogous to viruses. So <laughs> presumably the RNA world a good had things whose only goal in life was to have copies made of themselves by the replicates that was doing the real work of keeping life going, and they would have been viruses, the equivalent thereof. Yeah, in fact, I, yeah, let me make a comment that may not be immediately obvious to everybody. Uh, when we think of replicating RNA, we're thinking of molecules that might be a few hundred bases long that are sufficiently complicated to copy themselves. Then if we want to make more complicated RNAs, we might think of getting to molecules that may be a thousand bases long. And when I talked about RNA introns moving pieces of RNA around, I'm talking about sort of conjectures that you have molecules maybe a thousand bases long, and you've got 20 base long pieces separated by 100 base long introns, and you're putting, you're assembling those 20 base long pieces in the interesting molecules that are a few hundred bases long. That's a very, one of the reasons for that sort of size range turns out to be this error rate in the RNA copying. If I get to a molecule a thousand bases long, I can't actually copy it exactly. It's going to always have an error in it. Um, that means that the organisms that we're talking about, and we begin to talk about the first organisms that are inside a membrane, have a number of different thousand base long RNAs in it. They've got 10 or 12, maybe 50 different pieces doing different things, being copied, becoming enzymes, doing all sorts of things. Lots and lots of little pieces that all have to be held together, and if too many of them get lost, the organism doesn't work. And when we change the DNA, we begin now to talk of, of structures that are 50,000, 100,000, million bases long. Right. It's wildly different wildly different structures. And we see this in the viruses. We have RNA viruses that have 10 or 12 genomes in it. We have DNA viruses that are much, have much larger genetic structures. We see it all around us today. And you know, it influences the biology of the viruses in all sorts of ways, in how recombination works and all this sort of thing. So. Okay. Oh, the next question? Yes. Um, yes. Uh, you oh, my name is Timothy Thomas. Um, you presented to me what to me was a new idea, the idea that introns might be a kind of an analog to sexual reproduction in the, hence, in the sense that it accelerates variation in the, across the generations. So I'm wondering about the role of RNA and DNA in sexual reproduction and what you think about the fact that uh, uh, eukaryotes contain both intron scrambling and uh, DNA in sexual reproduction. That's a question for you, Wally. OK. Yes. <laughs> uh, generally, the time scales are different. Um, the time scale of sexual reproduction is the immediate mixture uh, very mixture and separation of the genes from the parents into the offspring of the next generation. And one of the arguments for why sex works so well is that 
um, the, combina the new combination of genes prevents parasites from learning how to get to the parent and get to all the offspring rapidly because we're constantly changing the pattern of genes in the offspring. Um, the recombination also takes place during sexual reproduction and it also produces novel gene combinations that are in the offspring that are not in the parents. Not that many novel combinations, 50. What in our case, uh, 46, I guess. 46 <laughs> novel. Close enough. Close enough. 46 <laughs> At novel, our age. novel combinations. Doesn't matter. Uh, plus a number of mutations. Um, whatever the right number is in humans, 200 per generation or something, something of that. I don't have to think about it to actually, to actually remember the number. Um, but the recombination process inside a gene that makes really novel combinations occurs in a given gene in a much longer period of time. Time scale way different. So. Hi, um, I'm David Grinspoon, Planetary Science Institute. Um, it's been a really fascinating discussion. And uh, to, to bring it uh, more explicitly back to astrobiology for a moment, um, in 1977, we didn't know if there were any other habitable planets. Now we know that there are perhaps 40 billion in our galaxy alone. Um, so. Imagining that some fraction of those might have carbon-based biospheres. I'm curious if you guys picture our, an RNA world as a sort of inevitable phase that those biospheres are likely to have gone through, or most of them, or some of them, or is it more a fluke, uh, potentially, of uh, terrestrial evolution? The universal. The, 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 you know, if you want, if, I mean, the, in fact, the, all of us, question. I think, in this discussion of the origin of life, we all, I think we all believe that if we can, in fact, duplicate the laboratory and the RNA world is one model of how you might duplicate it. We don't know it's the right one, but it's a model. It is a model which, when we think about it, we would think it gets used for an origin of life everywhere. Um, and I agree with you, we think there are very large numbers of probably Earth-like, probably carbon-based, you know, same, same, roughly the same chemistry, water and all that. Very many examples. I don't know if 40 billion is a perfectly good number. Um, and one would think that the underlying chemistry and physics is the same, and therefore an RNA world, which is a way of getting a life code, is the way, is the way of proceeding. Whether that leads to the same genetic code, it's an interesting question, and there's all sorts of arguments about what is the real structure of the genetic code. Is it an accident, or does it have a deeper structure that's related to the properties of the amino acids as they finally come out? Uh, we certainly, I think, all believe it's the same RNA molecules. It would be the same amino acids. Um, whether we think it would all be left-handed amino acids <laughs> is a different argument. You know, we might easily think, oh, that's an accident, and everything would be different. Uh, and I suppose my own prejudice is it's probably an accident. I don't, know of a I don't know of a physical reason why the sugars that we use and the amino acids we use have a specific hand in this. <laughs> Although, as mentioned earlier, one of the mysteries in physics is that there's matter and not antimatter, so, and which we, we don't know a reason for. So the, there could be a deeper reason in the amino acids that we do not know, but is related to the weak, the weak um, energy and things like that. I mean, every now and then somebody tries to conjecture <clears throat> that the asymmetry and the weak interactions is the reason that the amino acids are left-handed. Yeah, One doesn't yeah. know if that's true or not. Yeah. 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 That's why what we, we say or we should say is that we're trying to understand the origin of life as we know it and as the life here. Now it's your job as the planetary guy to go out and find us another life system. So if, you <laughs> find, if you can find us a second independently evolved life system, then we can compare them and say, well, see, lots of things are being shared by the independent origin or not. But, but, right, right, we're going to just but, need more money, right? Yeah. That's right. And, and unfortunately, if you find the same one, then we get into this panspermia argument. Yeah. We still don't know the answer. But, but it might be risky to look just for RNA. 
There are mm -hmm. folks that think there's something else that came before RNA that evolved into our RNA-like world that we imagine. Mm. Yeah. Well, David McKay thought he had found life in the meteorites from Mars, right? And one of the main criticisms of his is his fossil organisms were so small they couldn't hold numerous ribosomes that you would need, okay? <laughs> but it might be maybe they're living systems where they don't use ribosomes to make proteins. Maybe they do things very differently. And of course, or maybe it's just the RNA world molecule, uh, right. the RNA world organisms. They maybe. Right. And they prove. Right. But, but so if there's so much prejudice based on what we know about life here as to what we're, what we're going to find somewhere else, but we really need that second system. So I mean, if you go to Mars and you find life, the hope would be that it's independent origin as opposed to just lateral transfer between the planets. That's one of the reasons that in looking for life on Mars, we shouldn't look for ribosomes that are like exactly. ours. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There are some efforts beginning to, to look for uh, RNA world organisms that might still be extant on Earth. Mm -hmm. And looking at small water pockets in deep mines yeah. uh, and taking, extracting RNA from that droplet of water and uh, looking first for ribosomal RNA. If you find ribosomal RNA, it's not interesting because we're looking for the really early one. But any RNA that you can sequence and where you don't find ribosomal, ribosomal RNA is gonna be very interesting. Mm. It's just being looked at uh, at some low level. But it's cheaper than going to Mars. <laughs> <laughs> is, is it clear to everyone why if you find ribosomal RNA, it's not interesting? Do you wanna well, go over that just briefly? Well, if well, you're- It might be interesting. Go ahead. It might be interesting, <laughs> sure. but, but if it's not using ribosomal RNA, it's definitely interesting. <laughs> okay. Because presumably it would be before- It'd be different. The, right. the be ribosome different. had evolved. It'd be right. different right. in some yeah. way. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. But then yeah. you'd have to show that it's not a virus too. Right. I guess. <laughs> yep. Okay. Thanks. Like the sequence would tell you a okay. lot. Yep. All right. This will be the uh, last question and we'll wrap up. Okay, thank you. So my name is Daniel Benalevi. Uh, you just commented on something that was uh, missing to me. Um, maybe you can talk a bit about the connection between the RNA world and the genetic code. So um, after the genetic code was discovered, there were some papers that uh, they discussed the fact that similar amino acids are encoded by similar codons. And they say they... Uh, summarized that, that if it would be more, it is, might be adaptive that if you have a mutation, then a similar amino acid will be translated and there will be no damage. But assuming there was an RNA protein world, the sequence of the RNA should, also, should not just encode for something hereditary, but should also encode for a function. So certain nucleotides should, might have maybe related to certain functions. And maybe you can elaborate. So m maybe it can help to find today evidence for the RNA world because uh, one example I can find is that sugars are always activated by uracil and the translation, I the energy comes from GTP and for other, um, so you have examples in the cell that specific nucleotides are involved in specific processes or in specific compartments. So, yeah. Holly. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, well, uh, one's, one's thinking, I, I think one's thinking about how one gets from an RNA to world in which, let's say, we have cells with RNA and RNA enzymes and RNA being duplicated, and we begin to make polypeptides. That requires a process in which we gradually build up some way of recognizing the amino acids some way of stringing them together and some way of dictating that order. The final result of that is a genetic code of messenger and a translation molecule that recognizes the amino acid today with an enzyme in some previous instance without an enzyme and ties it to a message. Uh, it's not clear at all how that process occurs. There's no way of thinking that the enzyme that's the RNA enzyme that's being duplicated by the protein enzyme are related. They presumably arise separately and one replaces the other. Yes. Um, 
the conjecture about the code, one of the conjectures is what, as you mentioned, that there is some structure in the, there's several con possible conjectures. One type of conjecture is there is something about the codon or anti-codon that's related to the amino acid. And so as you begin to develop triplet codons or triplet anticodons, they, they pull out this, the appropriate amino acid. Another argument is, no, that's not the way it happened. You develop the codon, but you use the mutation structure to tie together related amino acids. And you, as I mentioned, there are arguments about the code. There's a paper called, the code is one in a million, as I remember. It's yeah, a very amusing smart. paper, and it tries to go in detail in trying to argue that the structure of the code it's has nice. certain, uh, you, certain features that make it look as though it's not a random connection right. between yes. amino acids yeah, and codons, not. but there's all sorts of interesting structure that's related to things like ability to withstand mutations, things like that. But as the comment I made, you know, the code can't be perfect in the sense that you have to have mutations. Be, yeah. Things have to change. Yeah. But, you know, there's all sorts of error correcting devices in the amino acid today, in the amino acid recognition. There's error correcting devices in the enzymes that look at the amino acids. You know, we, we, today's structure is a very complicated one that's full of detail. It goes beyond just the raw biochemical. You know, messenger makes protein, and there are all sorts of features that are involved in cannabis. How do we actually make proteins accurately enough to work? And some of that's even tied to the issue that proteins can't be too big because the error rate in the protein mm -hmm. finally begins to overcome the function of the protein. If you, you're better off put making proteins in moderately small chunks and putting them together to assemble large structures. And, and the several hypotheses are not mutually exclusive either, so. No. None of this is known well enough. Uh, but uh, if, if for fun, look up some of these papers on the structure of the code. There have been a number of people trying to conjecture things about that. Yeah. It's a, and, but, very, a cottage industry of some. Yeah, it's amusing industry. But in then the, the papers are fun. In the concept of the RNA world, the addition of the code is probably relatively recent, even though it's obviously extremely ancient. But your 50S particle, the ribosome has a 50S particle and a 30S particle. The decoding occurs in the 30S particle. You can completely eliminate the 30S particle and the 50S can still catalyze peptide synthesis, okay? And so, so the, whole, the whole catalytic part of the ribosome it doesn't need the messenger RNA, doesn't need the code. So, yep. yeah, so you, can make, you can make polypeptides, and they obviously would be random, and that's an, another matter, but all things considered, looking at the evolution of the ribosome, the coding part is, in the grand scheme of things, a relatively recent Good phenomenon. Right. Good point. Well, it's all, I mean, the great danger in all of this is we look on these in the wrong time frame. We're, we're used to thinking of enzymes as working quickly yeah, and, yes. you know, and the cells as well designed right. as they are today. And going back in this image of early evolution, one's trying to really think of something in which the organi organisms slowly grow, <laughs> very slowly, That's but cool. fast enough for the RNA not to decay. I mean, there's all <laughs> sorts of problems that hidden away in this. <laughs> I've, last I've been told there. we can have an encore question. <laughs> All right. No. Um, so last question, considering we're in D.C., uh, have any of you ever had discussions with policymakers or government officials about the origins um, of life, and especially with those policymakers who may have different views on this topic? Um, and if <laughs> mm. not, why? Good question. <laughs> it, it might be useless. <laughs> have you? It's a deeper oh. problem. <laughs> well, my, my, my postdoc sitting over here, Martin, just, just was here for such discussions. And he just came to this meeting for fun, but he was actually here for such discussions with what? Good. Some, some congressman? Yeah, I just speak to some of the congressmen from the state of Texas. They are not their heads, but I'm not sure they understood. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for trying. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate it. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.